Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. In this age of climate chaos and COVID-19, you count on Democracy Now! to stay focused on the issues that matter most. We count on you to support our independent journalism. If everyone who tunes into Democracy Now! gave just $4, we could cover our operating costs for 2022. Really, that's all it would take. Please do your part today by visiting us at democracynow.org. Oh, and stay safe, wear a mask, save lives. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. From New York, this is Democracy Now! Yeah! Workers at the Elmwood Starbucks store in Buffalo, New York, won a historic victory after they voted to unionize last week, making them the first to do so among the coffee chain's 9,000 locations in the United States. More stores have already filed to unionize in Boston. We'll speak with a Starbucks barista in Buffalo and go to Memphis to talk with one of 1,400 Kellogg's workers who've now been on strike for over two months. My name is Kevin Bradshaw, Vice President of Memphis 252G here in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm on strike with other workers, 1,400 workers across the United States in Omaha, Lancaster, Battle Creek, and Memphis. And we're fighting against the Kellogg Company for equal pay and equal benefits and also job security. Um, we've been on strike now for almost two months, and we're trying to make sure that all future workers and current workers have the same amount of pay and benefits and job security going forward in the future. This comes as President Biden's condemned Kellogg's plans to permanently replace striking workers. We'll look at the wave of union drives in labor organizing with historian Nelson Lichtenstein, author of State of the Union, A Century of American Labor. But first, a shocking Yahoo News expose reveals a secretive Customs and Border Protection Unit investigated as many as 20 journalists and their contacts by using government databases intended to track terror. Those investigated include the Pulitzer Prize-winning Associated Press reporter Martha Mendoza, along with others at the Huffington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. We'll speak with the reporter who broke the story, headlined Operation Whistlepig, inside the secret CBP unit with no rules that investigates Americans. It was so acceptable. Um, Everything Rambo did was under orders and, you know, assigned and directed and rewarded by the highest levels of CBP. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The death toll from the unprecedented weekend storms across the United States has risen to 90, with dozens still missing. In Kentucky, workers at the Mayfield Consumer Products Candle Factory, who survived the storm, said supervisors threatened to fire them if they left their shifts early Friday, even as forecasters warned of approaching tornadoes and warning sirens could be heard. Some of the workers left the factory ahead head of the storm, despite the threat to their livelihoods. At least eight people who remained died as a tornado ripped through the building and largely flattened it. More than 100 workers were trapped. Climate scientists say the rare December tornadoes are likely a result of the climate crisis. This is meteorologist Jeff Masters. We've got a warmer climate, and that means you can get a tornado any time of year. And so you've got to be prepared anywhere you live in the Midwest U.S., Southeast U.S. You can get a tornado in December, January, February. We've been seeing an increasing number of these off-season storms. So tornado season's all season long now, all year long. Climate scientists are sounding the alarm over newly discovered weaknesses in the ice shelf holding back one of Antarctica's most dangerous glaciers. The Washington Post reports the shelf appears poised to shatter within the next three to five years. Once the shelf collapses, ice from the vast Thwaites Glacier will flow more easily into the ocean, raising global sea levels. A complete collapse of the glacier could result in several feet of sea level rise inundating coastal communities home to hundreds of millions of people around the world. 
COVID-19 cases continue to surge in the United States, Europe and South Africa, where the fast-spreading Omicron variant was first detected. On Tuesday, South Africa's largest private health insurer reported Omicron appears to be substantially more contagious than even the Delta variant and reduces the effectiveness of existing vaccines, though people who are fully vaccinated are largely still protected against the severe disease. In Britain, Health Secretary Sajid Javid warned the Omicron coronavirus this variant is spreading rapidly across the UK and appears poised to overtake Delta as the dominant variant. It's spreading at a phenomenal rate. The number of infections is doubling every two or three days. There's going to be a tidal wave of infection. The second thing that we've learned in the last week is that two doses of the vaccine are not enough to protect you. But three doses, a booster shot, is uh, it will be hugely effective in, in protecting you against symptomatic infection. Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Monday announced the world's first known death link to the Omicron variant. Last week, Johnson reversed his longstanding opposition to public health measures and ordered new restrictions, including mask mandates and proof of vaccination, while urging people to work from home. Here in the United States, the number of confirmed coronavirus infections since the start of the pandemic has topped 50 million. Nearly 800,000 people have died of COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University researchers, with nearly 30 1,300 deaths reported Monday alone. California's ordered a new statewide indoor mask mandate beginning Wednesday after recording a 47 percent jump in COVID-19 cases since Thanksgiving. Here in New York City, beginning today, children age 5 to 11 will be required to have proof of vaccination to enter certain indoor places, such as restaurants. A proof of vaccination mandate for everyone 12 and up was already in effect. This is New York Mayor Bill de Blasio. We want to protect everyone, we want to protect our youngest New Yorkers. We know Omicron has had a lot of impact on younger folks. Uh, we know that we need a whole family to be safe, and if the youngest kids are safe, that also helps protect our seniors. On Monday, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to block New York State's vaccine mandate for health care workers. Petitioners had tried to claim religious exemptions. Meanwhile, the Air Force says it's discharged 27 service members for refusing to get vaccinated against COVID-19, as required by the Pentagon. The Pentagon said Monday no enlisted soldiers or officers will be punished for the deadly drone attack in Kabul during the final days of the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. The August attack killed 10 Afghan civilians, including seven children. This is Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby. What we saw here was a breakdown in process, um, an execution in procedural uh, 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 procedural events, not um, not the result of negligence, not the result of misconduct, not the result of of uh, of poor leadership. The Pentagon initially said the strike averted an imminent threat by the Islamic State and made other false claims about the attack, before being forced to walk back those claims and offer condolence payments to the victims' families because of press exposés. To see our coverage of the story, go to democracynow.org. In Sudan, police fired tear gas and rubber-coated bullets at crowds of protesters who gathered near the presidential palace Monday to demand the military hand over power to a civilian government to lead a transition to democratic rule. Dozens of protesters have been killed by Sudanese police and soldiers since the military toppled the caretaker Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdak in an October 25th coup. Sudan's military rulers reinstated Hamdak in late November amidst popular pressure, but the military is maintaining oversight over his cabinet. In Colombia, an independent investigation backed by the United Nations has found Colombian police were responsible for killing at least 11 people during massive anti-police brutality protests in Bogota in September 2020. The mobilizations were in response to the police killing of Javier Odoñez, a father of two who died after being pinned to the ground by Colombian police. Odoñez was shocked repeatedly with a stun gun for more than two minutes as he begged, please, no more. 
Denmark's former immigration minister has been sentenced to 60 days in prison after she was found guilty of illegally separating underage asylum-seeking couples. Inger Stoiber was accused of violating the European Convention on Human Rights. Judges overseeing her impeachment trial said Stoiber had intentionally neglected her ministerial duties when she ordered the separation of at least 23 asylum-seeking couples in 2016. She's known for promoting anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies in Denmark. Back in the United States, the House committee investigating the January 6 Capitol insurrections recommended former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows be found in criminal contempt of Congress. Meadows had agreed to cooperate with a subpoena from the committee, but reversed course last week, just ahead of a scheduled deposition. On Monday, the committee revealed Meadows played a larger role than previously known in plans to overturn the results of the 2020 election, as well as a failed effort by White House insiders to push Trump to call off the Capitol riot. The committee's vice chair, Republican Congressmember Liz Cheney, read text messages sent by three Fox News hosts to Meadows as the insurrection played out on live TV on January 6th. Mark, the president needs to tell people in the Capitol to go home. This is hurting all of us. He is destroying his legacy, Laura Ingram wrote. Please get him on TV, destroying everything you have accomplished, Brian Kilmeade texted. Quote, can he make a statement, ask people to leave the Capitol, Sean Hannity urged. As the violence continued, one of the president's sons texted Mr. Meadows, quote, he's got to condemn this ASAP. Although the Fox News hosts were pushing Trump to call off the insurrection, when they were on the air, they said they believed the protesters were Antifa. Survivors of the disgraced former USA gymnastics doctor and serial sexual abuser Larry Nasser have reached a $380 million settlement with USA Gymnastics, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, and their insurers. The settlement comes after a five-year legal battle and will cover claims brought by hundreds of women who were sexually abused by Nasser, including Olympic gold medalists Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, and Michaela Maroney. Rachel Denhollander, the first woman to publicly accuse Dr. Nasser, said, on Twitter, their settlement also includes survivors abused by coaches and other officials in the sport. Den Hollander tweeted, quote, some survivors are Olympians and elite gymnasts and wielded their platform powerfully. Most of the over 500 represented here are not, but showed up over and over again. We did this together. Don't forget their voices, what they gave and what it took, she said. In 2018, Dr. Nasser was sentenced to up to 175 years in prison for sexually assaulting and abusing more than 160 women and girl athletes. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange suffered a mini-stroke in a British prison in late October as he fought to avoid extradition to the United States to face espionage charges. That's according to Assange's fiance Stella Morris, who said the stroke left Assange with a drooping right eyelid, memory problems, and signs of neurological damage. Morris believes the stress from captivity, paired with endless legal challenges, has taken a deep toll on Assange's mental and physical well-being. On Friday, a British court ruled in favor of the Biden administration appeal to extradite Assange to face charges in the United States. The ruling has been condemned by journalists around the world as a major blow to press freedom. In Minnesota, the manslaughter trial of former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter continued Monday with a medical examiner testifying the wound Dante Wright received from Potter's handgun was not survivable. Potter has said she mistakenly shot Wright with her Glock 9 millimeter pistol, believing it was her taser. Minnesota State Investigator Sam McGinnis testified Potter failed to test her taser as required on the day she fatally shot Wright. He also laid out the differences between a Glock pistol and a taser. The taser is yellow, the firearm is black. The taser has a, a stocky body to it compared to the Glock handgun. The grip of the taser is shorter um, and wider than the Glock. Meanwhile, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin signaled Monday he's preparing to change his not guilty plea to guilty in a federal case charging he willfully violated George Floyd's civil rights. Chauvin was convicted of Floyd's murder and sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison.
And today is the ninth anniversary of the Sandy Hook school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. The 2012 massacre claimed the lives of 20 school children and six educators. Since Sandy Hook, there have been 350 U.S. school shootings, including 28 this year. But there still has been no major change in federal gun safety policy in the United States. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show with a shocking Yahoo News expose about a secretive Customs and Border Protection unit that investigated as many as 20 journalists and their contacts by using government databases intended to track terrorists. Those investigated by CBP's so-called counter-network division include the Pulitzer Prize-winning Associated Press reporter Martha Mendoza, along with others at The Huffington Post. Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Members of Congress and their staff may have also been targeted. The explosive revelations are detailed in a 500-page report by the Department of Homeland Security's watchdog unit, the Office of Inspector General. It opened the probe after news reports that a Border Patrol agent named Jeffrey Rambo conducted a leak investigation in 2017 by accessing government travel records of the reporter Ali Watkins, who was with Politico at the time and now works for The New York York Times. Rambo also shared the information he gathered with the FBI. In response to the report, the Justice Department declined to pursue criminal charges for misuse of government databases and lying to investigators, citing, quote, the lack of CBP policies and procedures concerning Rambo's duties. On Monday, the AP demanded an explanation. In a letter to DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, AP executive editor Julie Pace wrote, quote, This is a flagrant example of a federal agency using its power to examine the contacts of journalists. While the actions detailed in the inspector general's report occurred under a previous administration, the practices were described as routine, unquote. An AP spokesperson told Democracy Now!, quote, We're deeply concerned about this apparent abuse of power. This appears to be an example of journalists being targeted for simply doing their jobs, which is a violation of the First Amendment, they said. For more, we're joined by Jonna Winter, the investigative correspondent for Yahoo News, whose major new expose is headlined Operation Whistlepig, inside the secret CBP unit with no rules that investigates Americans. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Jonna. Take us through what took place and why this was called Operation Whistlepig. First, thanks for having me on. Uh, second, there's a lot of tentacles here, so just bear with me. Um, Operation Whistlebig was a leak investigation started by a Border Patrol agent named Jeffrey Rambo, who was detailed to CBP's Counter Network Division. And initially, his leak investigation targeted Ali Watkins and Senate staffer James Wolfe, but it spread to as many as 20 other journalists. And I'd also like to mention that we have no information that this is not occurring today. The same people are in charge. The same people are regularly, air quotes, kind of vetting journalists who they think might have information they would like to have or who they want to reach out to. And, uh, Jonna, if you could, could you talk about uh, why they began targeting Ali Watkins and the, the Senate Intelligence Committee staffer and how they originally uh, uh, how this uh, Rambo initially contacted her? Well, it began, as one definitely would not suspect, with an order from the White House to look at forced labor in the Democratic Republic of Congo, specifically about what companies were using cobalt mined by child labor to produce consumer goods like phones in, um, in China. So Rambo gets a tasking to come up with a plan to find these data points to give to the White House, who would then, in theory, hit them, hit the companies with um, sanctions under a tariff act of 1930. So Rambo puts together a list of reporters and NGO workers and government officials from other agencies and people from academia uh, who might provide information on these data points about what companies are using forced labor. On that initial list are reporters who specialize in these kind of reporting, um, like Martha Mendoza from the AP. Rambo also created another list. He was looking for a national security reporter with buzz who could, unbeknownst to the reporter herself, uh, publish articles 
that were not necessarily accurate, that would overstate the capabilities of U.S. law enforcement to essentially trick these companies into altering their shipping patterns, which would be enough evidence to hit them with sanctions under the Tariff Act of 1930. So that's where Allie Watkins comes in. He saw, Rambo saw her article trending on Twitter and thought, okay, I'll use Allie Watkins. And that's how it happened. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, Rambo himself, uh, any sense of how far, how high up in the chain of command the knowledge of this surveillance of, re of reporters' uh, activities went? Yeah, I want to be really clear. I mean, Rambo is obviously the fall guy here. There was a Washington Post story a long time ago that talked about him being this rogue agent. And if only. I mean, now we know, based on all of these documents, that everything he did on every single step of the way, from his plan targeting journalists, to reaching out to journalists, to the vetting of journalists, to looking into their sources, to contacting the FBI, to running a leak investigation in-house, to then contacting the FBI again. All of this was done with the knowledge and under the orders of his boss, Dan White, who was referred for criminal prosecution for multiple things, including making false statements to investigators. And he's now back at his job running his division, and DHS will not talk about this or say anything publicly about what is going on. But this goes all the way up. This is not, these aren't political appointees who are tasked with something at CBP. These were career officials who are still running this secretive unit with no rules and no procedures for how they access these databases. And they're target, you know, targeting Americans who are located in the United States who are not suspected of any crime whatsoever. But let's be clear, Jana, um, talking about it not being a rogue operation, as you point out in your piece, one of the keepsakes that Rambo has from his time in the Washington area is a large glass globe with cobalt blue oceans and clear <laughs> land, an award from CBP for his work that came with a cash bonus. The globe is a reminder that before the press coverage— um, before the press coverage, he was lauded for his work at the National Targeting Center, including on the Watkins Wolf case. Yeah. The plaque on the globe reads, Jeffrey Rambo, in honor and recognition of your dedication to the National Targeting Center Counter Network Division of 2017. And at his going away party, his boss even cited his work on the leak investigation, Jana. Yeah, he was a hero inside CBP until this became public. So he definitely has been thrown under the bus here, um, whether not saying what he did was great at all. But this was something that I mean, they also made him the five eyes representative for all of DHS. There's one person that does that for their uh, annual or biannual or something meeting. He was a hero internally and was completely blindsided um, by them throwing him under the bus and saying, you know, oh, we're going to investigate this guy. We have no idea what this is. This is a completely rogue agent who did all of these things. And his life has been severely impacted by this. But I think it's important to, I mean, no offense, but not to focus on Rambo here. I mean, this is much bigger than him. It's going on today. The administration is silent, burying their heads in the sand like we won't notice. And the same people, despite criminal referrals, are back at work doing these same things. So, Jana, let's go back uh, in response to your Yahoo News report. Democratic Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon has called on DHS's inspector general to turn over its investigation to Congress immediately. Wyden said in a statement Sunday, if multiple government agencies were aware of this conduct and took no action to stop it, there needs to be serious consequences for every official involved, and DHS and the Justice Department must explain what actions they're taking to prevent this unacceptable conduct in the future. Of course, Senator Wyden is chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, it, can you talk about even the report, this 500-page report that you got a hold of, that the senators are saying they can't get? I mean, first of all, I mean, that's ridiculous. I just think— I mean, personally, just as a regular person, I'm super disappointed with many aspects of this, including the oversight aspect. I think CBP launched an investigation into one of their own. DHS inspector general did what they do, which is launch an investigation to follow up. And they recommended things for prosecution. I don't know. They did not answer my questions about if they had provided oh, this nice. report to Congress. Yeah, they didn't answer that. Um, I don't want to be too negative on them because they were literally the only agency that got back to me out of everyone 
um, under deadline and actually said something that was responsive to something I asked. Not this particular question, but um, so I don't really know if they were supposed to hand it over to Congress. I imagine they they should have done that. Um, but I there's so many. I think we're looking at this from the wrong end. I think that this is by design. I think this is not some, oh, of course, all the agencies knew about this and that was a mistake. It's no, this was a division created to avoid, you know, the, the pesky bureaucracy involved with sharing sensitive d information and databases. The person running the team, Rambo's boss, who, again, was referred for criminal prosecution and is back at work running the same team, uh, told investigators during all this that their division pushes the limits. Um, they are the guidelines. There are no other ones. They're the ones making the decisions. They're the ones making the rules. And DOJ was certainly involved because this material was passed on to the FBI. And it was there's no way to say that it wasn't used during the prosecution of James Wolfe, the Senate aide. It's just not possible. Um, you can see the travel records. He lied about the travel records. He went to jail for lying about these things. Um, there's a direct connection. DHS oversees this. The White House right now, this is not just a Trump political moment. This is an ongoing division that exists to skirt these rules. And the people who run it said as much to OIG investigators. So this is not, you know, I just think, I don't know. I'm interested to see if Wyden can get any traction, obviously, um, since we have been ignored in, in every capacity. And frankly, his office has been ignored in this exact capacity for quite a while. And the and yeah, Penny Thompson... No, you don't. Uh, go John, ahead, sorry. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the FBI. Uh, could you talk about their involvement in this? And also, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the case against Wolf. I don't know if, if, if many listeners to our program are aware of that. Could you talk about that case specifically? Sure. Um, so, James Wolf used to be the director of security for the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he went to jail for went to prison for two months for, after pleading guilty to charges, I guess in the beginning, here's what happens. So Rambo um, is looking into contacting these reporters. He's looking at Allie Watkins, who's then a Politico rising star national security reporter. He vets her, meaning he runs all of her travel, uh, you know, looks at her travel, sees that she's traveling with this older gentleman, um, older by more than 30 years, who he later identifies as this Senate aide. This is James Wolf. So Rambo starts this leak investigation before he even arranges to meet Ali Watkins under an alias and all sorts of other weird things. He reaches out to an FBI contact of his who is now at headquarters and says, I've got something I think is in your swim lane. Please call me immediately. So Rambo is working with the FBI very early on this. Um, and what he sees is a reporter who is getting classified information from this man that he thinks she is dating. Um, Allie Watkins continues to say that she did not receive information from that person. And he, James Wolf, was never convicted or even charged with leaking classified information, just to be clear. But the FBI, um, he, Jeff Rambo, passed along all of Allie's um, travel records, Facebook posts, all sorts of other data that they had run from her, um, her connections to the terror watch list, um, which dragged up Ariana Huffington, who is objectively not a terrorist, I think we all know. Um, and continue to, you know, pull all of these records. And he wanted to hand over, Rambo wanted to hand over all this information to the FBI the day after he met with Ali Watkins. He said, you know, I believe that she is leaking information. I mean, she's receiving leaked information from him. Let's pass this to the FBI as a leak investigation. His boss, Dan White, again, the same one who's still there now, he said, no, 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 why don't we just take a minute and continue to investigate her in-house? Let's see if she has any sources within the Department of Homeland Security. So they ran a whole other investigation, which is Operation Whistle Pig, named after the whiskey that Rambo drank when he was meeting with Ali Watkins at the bar. Um, there are so many parts of this where, yeah. So um, over time, uh, Rambo has amped up his investigation, but he finds out that the FBI is actually not pursuing his probe until he gets back to San Diego at the end of his detail to the targeting center. And he gets a call that says, hey, it's the FBI. We have just opened up a new leak investigation unit in-house, and we would love all this information again. So John, then we have 30 sign. seconds. Okay. So basically, we have no idea how many other reporters have been investigated by the FBI thanks to this unit that has no rules and no procedures and continues to operate today. 
John Winter, investigative correspondent for Yahoo News. We will link to your major new exposé, Operation Whistlepig, inside the secret CBP unit with no rules that investigates Americans. When we come back, we speak with one of the workers at a Buffalo Starbucks that just won a historic victory after they voted to unionize last week, making them the first to do so among Starbucks' 9,000 stores in the United States. Then to Memphis to speak with one of 1,400 Kellogg's workers who have now been on strike for two months. Stay with us. Murderers by John Fusciante. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we turn now to look at the historic workers' victory at the Elmwood Starbucks store in Buffalo, New York, where workers successfully voted to unionize last week, making them the first to do so among Starbucks' 9,000 locations in the United States. <laughs> Work workers cheered as the results of their vote were announced. Nineteen workers voted in favor, eight against forming the union. A union vote failed at a second Buffalo Starbucks location, and a third election at the Buffalo Airport Starbucks has not yet been confirmed after nearly half the yes votes were challenged. The National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, will now review those votes. The victory in Buffalo came despite Starbucks' union-busting efforts and could trigger similar drives at more of its stores across the country. Already on Monday, workers at two Massachusetts Starbucks in Boston and Brookline filed paperwork with the NLRB petitioning to unionize. For more, we're joined by one of the Starbucks workers you just heard cheering in Buffalo. Jazz Brissack is a barista at the Elmwood Starbucks store there. She is now the first—this is now the first location of Starbucks to unionize. She's with Starbucks Workers United. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Jazz. Why don't you explain the significance of your victory and also what Starbucks did, bringing in management from all over the highest levels to try to pressure workers? Thanks so much for having me. And I think, like you're saying, it's important. Um, we won our union, thank goodness. Um, and the Genesee store, which was actually packed with people who don't even vote at that store, um, to try to inflate the voter list. We're very confident that they're going to also be the other of the first unionized Starbucks. Um, but it shouldn't have had, we shouldn't have had to go through all of the union busting that we've gone through in the past four months. Um, Starbucks sent in a SWAT team, they called it, of upper managers, over 100 of them, led by the president of Starbucks North America, Rossanne Williams. And these managers came into our stores. They were there in every shift, every day part, um, pulling people off the floor, working on the floor so that they could prevent us from being able to have honest conversations with our partners. Um, and we went from having, you know, 85% at my store, 100% of voters signed up on union cards at Genesee to, you know, fighting for our lives to even win one of these first Starbucks unions. And could you talk, Jazz, about some of the conditions that prompted the employees to, uh, to believe that they needed to unionize? I mean, honestly, we were unionizing because we wanted a voice in the workplace. Um, we didn't think that, you know, Starbucks was by any means the worst employer. There's things that could always be better. Um, I had a coworker when we started the union campaign, she'd been there 11 years. She was making 16 cents more than a new hire. Um, and 
certainly like healthcare and mental health and certain things could be better. But we really just want to voice on the job. And we want, we don't believe that any job should not have a union because we think that everything should have more democracy. Um, and I think the real crisis or tragedy here is we would have won so many more stores already if we had actually had a fair process for these votes. But instead, Starbucks took advantage of every delay tactic possible, um, most of which were loopholes created by the Trump labor board um, to delay us getting to our votes and actually being able to unionize and to give them more time to have anti-union meetings and threaten us with you know, losing benefits, losing the right to pick up shifts or transfer, um, and trying to pit us against our fellow partners, against our managers, and um, blame the union for all of the stress and tension that we were feeling. And could you talk about the the the, uh, the company tactics? Uh, Starbucks uh, portrays itself as an enlightened, uh, socially conscious uh, uh, company. Uh, were you surprised by the vehemence with which they marshaled their forces to prevent uh, this union drive? 100 percent. In the beginning, we actually asked them to sign the fair election principles, which is a set of guidelines that sets a higher standard than U.S. labor law for how companies act during union elections. And, you know, it seems naive that we expected them to sign it. But instead, um, this company that says that they're a social justice company, they say they're a different kind of company, hired Littler Mendelssohn, which is the most notorious union busting law firm in the country. And literally ran not even a textbook anti-union campaign, but an almost unprecedented anti-union campaign of bringing in literally the COO, the president of Starbucks North America, and all of their other corporate underlings um, to try to disrupt Buffalo and turn our stores upside down. And can you talk about what happened at the other two uh, Starbucks where the workers were attempting to unionize? Results not completely in, is that right, are being challenged on both sides? So um, at camp, they were totally disrupted, and um, there were some ballots that weren't actually counted. So we're still figuring out what all happened there. Um, and then at Genesee, they had stacked the voter list with partners from other stores that were remodeling. Um, not every worker who worked at that store um, got a ballot. They selectively picked who they wanted to receive ballots and put on that voter list. Um, one of our partners told Bernie Sanders during the town hall that he hosted that it was like if you had partners, sorry, if you had um, tourists from Texas visit Vermont and then vote in Senator Sanders' Senate election. Um, so I think once those ballots are cleared up, it's going to be a clear victory at the Genesee store. And finally, your response to hearing that Brookline and a Boston store are already um, attempting to unionize there and go beyond uh, just Starbucks, your message. I think our movement is growing. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the Boston partners, the Arizona partners, and the partners in the other stores in Buffalo. I do want to note that there's three more stores that are going to union elections, and Starbucks is terrified that Elmwood will be the first domino. So they're already cracking down much harder. We have a organizing committee leader, Angel, in one of these stores, who's being written up and retaliated against for the most minor of things. They're finding ways to target her, because they realized that what they were doing earlier wasn't enough to stop us and break us apart. So they're trying to go even harder. So we need even more community pressure on Starbucks to stop union busting and actually come to the bargaining table and work with our union instead of busting it. Jazz Brissak, I want to thank you for being with us, barista at Starbucks store in Buffalo, New York, which has become the first location in the United States to unionize, the first Starbucks location. She's with Starbucks Workers United. As we turn now to the 1,400 Kellogg's workers who've remained on strike for over two months, demanding fair wages and better working conditions. Last week, Kellogg said it would start replacing striking workers 
hours with permanent hires after a tentative five-year agreement with the company was rejected by an overwhelming majority of Kellogg's cereal plant workers. The deal would have provided 3 percent raises. Kellogg's announcement drew backlash from across the country, with many demanding a boycott of Kellogg's products in solidarity with striking workers. On Friday, President Biden tweeted, I am deeply troubled by reports of Kellogg's plans to permanently replace striking workers. Permanently replacing striking workers is an existential attack on the union and its 